Good afternoon. My name is Alex White. I'm a Director General here at the Institute of International and European Affairs, and you're more than welcome to this, um, what I know is going to be a really interesting uh, webinar. Um, I'm really delighted to um, welcome you to this fourth event, as it is now, of the 2024 Development Matters Lecture Series here at the Institute, which is sponsored, of course, by Irish Aid. And uh, we very much uh, welcome uh, um, the generous support and cooperation always of Irish Aid for this series. Um, it's also marking, as we've been reminding people in this series, 50 years, the 50th anniversary of Irish Aid, which, of course, was an initiative taken as a prerequisite um, back um, in the 1970s when Ireland joined what was then called the EEC. Uh, so um, it's it's terrific to be marking that in this lecture series. Um, we're joined this afternoon by the Director General of the uh, International Organization for Migration, Amy Pope. It's just terrific to have her with us. Um, when um, in a couple of minutes, Amy will speak to us for make a presentation for maybe about 20 minutes or so. We're not too rigid, 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, however that works out. And then we'll have a Q&A. Um, so please, if you're interested in asking a question, pop it into the Q&A uh, function there uh, on Zoom and we'll get to your question uh, in due course. So you can also um, bear in mind that, um, please, that today's Q&A and the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. Um, and you can also join us on X, as it's now known, if you want, or on social media. Use the handle at IIEA if you're motivated to doing that. And we're also, we'd like to uh, mention live streaming this afternoon's discussion. So very warm welcome if you're tuning in via YouTube. Michael Gaffey is um, Director General of the Development Cooperation at Africa Division in Irish Aid. And I'm really pleased, before we go to our distinguished guest, really pleased to invite Michael just to say a few words by way of introduction. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, Jill, and thank you to all the staff of the IIEA uh, for all their work on this lecture series that we work together on, Development Matters Lecture Series, which is a, a, an important forum for, for debate. Uh, look, it is a real honour for me to uh, welcome uh, the Director General of the International Organisation for Migration, Amy Pope, to speak in this series. Just on a slightly personal note, I was the uh, Irish ambassador in Geneva when Amy Pope arrived as the uh, new one of two deputy directors general, and uh, she was particularly helpful to us in one particular issue. Uh, and since then, she has had a remarkable, you might almost say phenomenal, uh, victory uh, in the election to be director general uh, of the IOM. So belatedly, I suppose we congratulate her on that and wish her well in her work because the issue of migration has never been more to the forefront than it is today. And uh, the, the perceptions and misperceptions of migration um, are issues of politics and economics and they're issues in the public domain. Uh, in Ireland, they have come to the fore uh, in a very political way in recent months and have been the subject of much debate and, and in a way, the subject of, 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 of two votes in, in two elections. So Ireland, as a major source of migration over the years, is now in a different place and, and, and grappling with that and engaging with that. And I think we would all say that it's important that we bear in mind our own history as we look uh, at, the, at the world today. So just to say that the relationship between IOM and Ireland's uh, International Development Programme has grown significantly in, in recent years. And following the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration in 2018, and in recognition of IOM's key role on that compact, compact we first provided core funding from our development budget in 2019 and we have continued to do that and will continue uh, to do so and we've also worked with iom on two areas of particular importance that i'll mention one addressing misconceptions and indeed deliberate misinformation <clears throat> about migration through the global migration media academy and also cooperating on moving forward the implementation of objective 19 of the global contact for migration on but diasporas and development through our co-hosting of the Global Diaspora Summit in Dublin in 2022. So we have really good cooperation. We'd like to develop it further. 
We're really looking forward to hearing from uh, Director General Pope today. And I just want to, in front of everyone, say that we would also really hope that before too long she would be able to uh, visit us in Ireland. So thank you very much, Alex, and uh, welcome to everyone to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Michael, uh, for that. And now it just um, falls to me to introduce our distinguished guest. Amy Pope is Director General of the International Organization uh, for Migration. It's a post that she's held since October 2023. Um, as Michael said, um, Amy brings a wealth of experience um, to addressing these uh, this complex um, issue, these complex migration issues, having previously spent actually a period, I note, in, in as a, an advisor, senior advisor in the White House, and also worked for some time um, with uh, Chatham House out of London, and a lot of other posts and uh, um, activities over the years, so that she, as I say, brings so much experience and insight to this issue. And um, I think it would be fair to say has displayed a, a passion for changing the narrative or the global narrative uh, about people on the move for whatever reason they're on the move. She's the first woman to hold the post uh, in the um, in the organ in the international organization for migrations history, 73 year, 73 year history. So congratulations for that. And thank you for being with us. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. The floor is now finally yours. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Alex and uh, Michael Gaffey, for the invitation to speak at this renowned Development Matters series. And thank you also to the IIEA uh, for, for highlighting the importance of migration. I mean, we know this topic of migration is touching every single one of us here in one way or another. Ireland is the great migration success story. It's played such an important role in your history over the last 200 years or so. We know, um, I'm an American, as you can hear, I'm sure, the Great Famine triggered the exodus of millions of people, many of whom ended up in my own country. And you know that um, for the United States, the, the um, Irish migration is actually part of who we are as a person or as a country and as, as an important part of the success that we've had as a country. But we know that when people come, it's not just that they escape the famine and their problems are over. A lot of migrants then and now came desperately poor and they were crowding into low cost housing. There were issues with schools and health care and sanitation. They were subject to terrible prejudice and discrimination um, in my country and Yet we know that despite all of these extraordinary challenges, the industrial sector that was really exploding in the U.S. at that time absorbed those who wanted to work. And the Irish and other nationalities built roads, railways, canals, and a whole lot more in my country and really put the United States on the map in ways that it was not before we had this significant wave of migration. And it plays out today. I mean, you see it all the time, right? We have extraordinary contributions in every sector, whether it's politics, business, and technology, sports, education, entertainment, entrepreneurs, many, many more. I myself worked for some famous Irish Americans. Um, uh, Joe Biden himself is probably um, one of your uh, most proud champions of the Irish diaspora. Um, he certainly has read Irish poetry to my own children and anybody who walks into his office will be subjected to stories um, of the impact of Ireland on the rest of the world. But of course, uh, for the United States, John Kennedy, Barack Obama, Ronald Reagan in politics, Judy Garland, even Mariah Carey um, are, are really important Irish Americans who've enriched our country and of course then enrich Ireland as well. And I'm focusing on your history a bit because I think sometimes when we talk about migration, we forget that migration is human, that migration informs civilization. I mean, humans are a migratory species. There's no way around that. And by the end of the 19th century, almost 40% of the Irish born population were living abroad. So we know today the picture looks different, right? It is different nationalities leaving, different people who are moving, but the bottom line factors are actually not that different. And the impact of migration in the end is not that different. 
And I think sometimes we forget that when we're facing a pressure within a society at any given moment in time. And so my hope today is we have a much broader conversation about what migration looks like and how we drive some real benefits from migration while also addressing some of the challenges. So now what we've seen, crisis has driven people to leave, but a stronger economy in Ireland is bringing people home. And it's joined by migrants from all around the world. So Ireland went from a country of origin to increasingly a country of destination. The EU statistics on immigration are showing that the proportion of the population of the Irish state who are born overseas reached a record 22% in 2023. It's a new migration flow. We call it a brain gain. Um, you might have had a brain drain 100 years ago, but now we're seeing a, the flip side of that, bringing really significant economic impact into Ireland. And in the United States, the population today represents about 5% of the global total, but, but close to 20% of all international migrants reside in the United States today. And this has actually proven to be extremely beneficial from an economic point of view much less from a cultural, um, uh, from a food point of view and from every other dimension. I mean, in fact, it's shown that as a result of the higher immigration in recent years, the United States has recovered faster than any other country post COVID. And not all of that migration, by the way, was through regular channels. It's not just in Ireland, it's not just in the United States. And this is important because globally, whether we're talking about across the African continent or in Asia um, or in Latin America, migration and migrants are driving economic resilience or driving growth or driving prosperity. And we recognize it within the UN. Our 2030 agenda recognizes that migration is a powerful tool for development. We recognize that it brings benefits in the form of skills and strengthening the workforce and investment and cultural diversity. And ultimately it is contributing to the improving the lives of communities in ways that are also intangible in addition to the transfer of skills that we're seeing. And of course the economic benefits. Last year, the World Bank released its development report. It shows overwhelming evidence of how migration is fueling economic prosperity. And last year, this just recent year, um, a couple months ago, we released our own world migration report. And just one, one fact alone can demonstrate how powerful migration can be. International remittances has increased by 650% over the last 20 years. So in, 20, in 2000, it was about $128 billion in the money being sent back by migrants to their home countries. Today, it's $831 billion in remittances is going back to a migrant's country of origin. And $647 billion is being sent back to low and middle income countries. That is more than foreign direct investment. It is more than overseas development assistance. And it is a significant portion of these countries' GDPs um, really driving sustainable development in their countries. So it is no surprise to you that I am a real advocate for changing the narrative on migration because what we are seeing in the news, what we see if you turn on your TV at any moment in time is that migration is chaotic, migration is tragic, that people are dying um, on the sea, that people are struggling to find their way to Europe. And while that is true, there are terrible tragic consequences as a result of irregular migration. There's also a tremendous benefit because of regular migration. Now, the system is out of whack, and that's the part that we are really looking to address, right? For many, many people who are living in a desperate situation, they see claiming asylum, taking an irregular journey, arriving at a destination country and then seeking asylum has become their best choice and often seen as their only option to a better life. And I know 
right there in Ireland, you are seeing the impacts of that. I've heard about the housing shortage. It's a major concern dominating the debate there in Ireland. And I've even heard of Irish citizens who are moving abroad because they cannot find affordable housing at home. But at the same time, we know that there is a, there's a rise in asylum across the world. Those seeking international protection have been arriving across the world in record numbers in the first few months of this year alone. Now, we also know that it is not just migrants who are seeking support from the state, right? The number of migrants who are coming, who are seeking asylum, are often competing for people who otherwise need support uh, from the state. And we know that there in Dublin, you've seen asylum seekers who are living in tents on the streets. We know that there are also thousands of Irish people who are homeless too. And often, these are, of course, legitimate concerns, but often these issues become conflated. And so the conversation around migration becomes about the people who are living on the streets or the people for whom the system has failed, as opposed to how we can use migration as a tool to drive better better uh, outcomes for more people around the world. Now, I said that the system is broken, right? So, and the reason I, I focus on that because the numbers of people who are on the move are continuing to grow. In every part of the world, people are fleeing conflict, they're fleeing violence, they're fleeing food insecurity, they're fleeing economic hardship and the impacts of climate change. And increasingly, some combination of all of the above. Last year, 117 million people were forcibly displaced. And most of them, 70 million of them, were displaced inside their own countries. Interestingly, the vast majority of the world's refugees and those who are in need of protection, about 75%, are being hosted in low and middle income countries. And often it's just the country next door. So I was recently in Chad, where there are hundreds, thousands of people who are fleeing the conflict in Sudan. As you may know, Sudan is now the world's biggest displacement crisis. 10.5 million people are displaced in Sudan, but they're fleeing to places like Chad, to Eritrea, to South Sudan, to countries that already have very low resilience, very low capacity, and who are now taking on pretty significant burden by having additional people move into their countries without the capacity to support them. And we know that this is happening despite rhetoric about whether or not people should move, despite evidence that when people move irregularly, that they are facing um, exploitation, that they're facing abuse. But the bottom line is that people, when they're faced with very few options, they move. If people are rational, they're making decisions to go despite the, the dangers and despite the fact that that there are many, many stories of people who are exploited al along the way. So for us, this is an important piece to really focus on. How do we change the dynamic where people are increasingly being pushed to move, right? Where the impact of violence, of climate change, of disaster means that they can no longer live at home or they have very, very poor options at home. Um, and then look at ways that they can move safely. So that is brings us to how do we build a global migration system that actually works? How do we create systems where people can migrate safely in a humane way with dignity in a way that is orderly and frankly in a way that does not put pressures on the political conversation in a very negative way there's also good reason to do it just from a, a humanitarian point of view last year we know that at least 8500 people died en route when they were migrating it was our deadliest year on record. And when I say 8,500, those are only the people we know about. Those are the bodies who've been found, who've been identified. We know that there are probably far more people who have died along the migration journey who have just remained unknown or invisible. We also know that smugglers and traffickers made an estimated $10 billion off of the backs of vulnerable people last year. And again, that's just the number we've been able to estimate. 
it could be much higher. So this is a big business where people who are extremely vulnerable, who are facing very few choices are being put into a position where they're subjected to exploitation and abuse at the same time that we need migration around the world, right? So, so this is the conundrum. So our goal is to create a migration system that works, to change the narrative from one that's highly politicized and divisive to one that tells a true story, which is documented across the board of the enormous potential and benefits of migration and migrants. So this goes back to the question of how do we do this? Now, number one, we gotta start with the facts. We need to dispel the myths and the false narratives around migration. The work we've done with the government of Ireland is really important in terms of countering misinformation. And I wanna just say from the get-go, we need to be clear that if a person is fleeing a well-founded fear of persecution that is established under the 1951 Refugee Convention, they have the right to seek asylum. They have the right for protection. This falls squarely within the mandate of our sister agency, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, and we're 100% behind it. But we also know that asylum systems across Europe, across the Americas, are overwhelmed. Mexico, for example, saw unprecedented numbers of people seeking asylum in Mexico. And what it is also showing us is that not everybody who is seeking asylum is getting it because they ultimately are fleeing not because of persecution, but because of other reasons, but other reasons that are no less dire for the people who are facing them. We see that one of the ways to build out better systems is to create other options for people who are on the move. And I want to just call out the EU Migration Pact. I know there's been a lot of conversation about this, good and bad, but at IOM, we see the EU Migration Pact as a positive step because it is a way to have a comprehensive approach to the issue of migration and asylum in Europe. And we believe that if it is properly implemented, it has the potential to boost public confidence in the system. It is it will improve the integrity of borders, and we believe it can improve the rights of people on the move. But, but this is just one small part of a much bigger picture, and we are welcoming of the pact. We're ready to provide practical assistance, but ultimately, we need to have a big picture approach of what migration means if we're going to really maximize the full potential of migration to drive growth and prosperity, but also protect and assist those who are in need. So we at IOM have come out with our new strategic plan. Basically, we have three objectives. And our goal here is to really cover the world of why people move and how we drive better outcomes. Now, the first one is, is just very straightforward. It's to save lives and to protect people on the move. And that's, that is the number one, uh, uh, in terms of funding, in terms of work, the number one thing we do. So people who are displaced by disaster, by the floods in Libya, for example, by earthquakes, by wildfires, um, people who can no longer live at home because their house has been destroyed, people who can no longer farm because six seasons of drought mean that they can no longer harvest any food for their family. We're providing support to those people who are on the move. And we're looking at those in particular who have vulnerabilities, but are not eligible for refugee protections. So last year from Ukraine to Sudan, Libya, Haiti, to many other crisis hit countries around the world, we provided support to about 32 million people. That includes refugees, but also internally displaced people, uh, vulnerable migrants, host communities. And we did so by providing direct assistance or community-based programming. But we can't stop there, right? If we're just reacting to crisis, we will never be move beyond the crisis point. And we see this, right? There are places in Kenya, for example, where an entire generation has been born and grown up and now has children living in a situation of displacement. And the community, the international community as a whole has failed to move from 
the humanitarian response, which of course is critical in the early moments of a crisis, into the space of driving solutions for displacement. So that's the second objective in our strategy. And it, we believe that we can start to address it even before the crisis strikes. So let's take climate change as one example. It is a major cause of displacement. About 80% of internally displaced people now live in countries that are highly vulnerable to climate change. Last year, in 2022, 33 million people were displaced because of floods, drought, extreme heat, or storms. And frankly, importantly, last year, more new displacements were a result of climate impact versus conflict. You even see it there in Ireland. Nobody is immune, right? Rising sea levels are threatening your own coastlines and the lower inland areas. We see it in the United States. But problem is most acute for those who do not have the resilience to respond. And unfortunately, it's often those who've had the done the least to, to contribute to the problem. It's the people who are the least able to adapt, the people who are already living in very sustainable ways. They're living off the land. They're not high users of energy, for example, but they are being overwhelmed. And our view is that rather than waiting for people to be displaced, rather than waiting for people to starve because they can't farm or people to lose their homes, there's much more we can do on the prevention side. It means looking at communities that are at high risk for displacement and making sure they have the services they need, building up their infrastructure to make them more resilient to climate hazards, and then looking at their livelihoods and assessing whether or not they can withstand climate risks. And that's work we're doing all around the world in ways that may sound unexpected. For example, in West and Central Africa, we are working on a livestock tracking tool. So it's an early warning system that documents when people who are pastoralists will start moving because their livestock can no longer feed because of soil moisture loss. And then they're moving into lands that are traditionally agricultural lands, and that creates conflict. So we've started tracking those movements, anticipating the conflict, and then working with the communities that are facing that convergence, that tension, to diffuse the tension before it gets out of hand and creates a regional conflict. We're also working specifically with a small island developing states, Nations like Tuvalu, 14,000 people in the entire country of Tuvalu, but it is at risk of totally disappearing. They are on the sharp edge of climate change. And the goal is to work with those communities to build their resilience, or in some cases, to use migration as an adaptation strategy. Meaning that rather than waiting till people are displaced, you enable people to move safely and to move with dignity. So that's the third piece of this strategy, right? We can prevent displacement to some extent, but we're not going to cover the world of, of people who are at risk. So we need to be thinking about how people can move safely, about how people can move regularly, rather than moving in a haphazard way, which really stresses the host communities where migrants are coming in. Now, the first is the, the best way is just reducing the risk of exploitation, making sure that we have migrant rights, human rights, labor rights at the center of the work we're doing. That is coming when we put, when somebody has access to a regular pathway, they're less likely to be exploited than if they are coming in through an irregular pathway. We also know that labor mobility pathways are bringing in skills, strengthening the workforce, leading to cultural diversity, boosting local economies, improving the lives of communities in the country of origin, as well as in the country of destination. In my country, in the United States, migrants have been directly responsible for revitalizing aging communities that had basically emptied out because people had left for jobs in other parts of the world. Migrants have now come in and brought new life new wealth, new prosperity to parts of the United States that people had otherwise given up on. 
We're also seeing that will become more and more important as, frankly, many countries around the world are aging. And Ireland is no exception here. We're seeing as people choose to have fewer children, um, the demographics are shifting in a way that you will no longer have the workforce you need to have the kind of development you've seen over the last 20 years. So migrants can offer a solution, making a significant contribution in high skill, medium skill, lower skilled op occupations in countries all over the world. In developing countries, generally, the contribution of immigrants to the GDP is an average of 7%. So facilitating regular pathways so that people can move safely and with dignity, it's really at the heart of what we see as a whole of society approach. And our goal is to move the conversation out of just the planning that happens within a Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Interior Ministry or Home Office and bring the conversation to all policy areas to look at what's the impact of migration on urban planning, on housing, on healthcare, on education. Because we know that people are needed, but we know that when you don't have that planning, it can stress systems in ways that can be quite detrimental um, and ultimately undermine what we're trying to do. We're also trying to ensure that these new pathways are accessible to make sure that they are inclusive and to make sure they're reaching the people who may otherwise migrate irregularly if they don't know that there is a regular pathway to take advantage of. So ultimately, we think there's a whole range of solutions that can work here. It goes from regularizing the status of migrant workers having humanitarian visas or family reunification visas, using private sponsorship so that churches or community groups or families are sponsoring vulnerable migrants or refugees, and making sure people then have access to public services and, and even temporary work permits when they come, if they're not coming in on a labor visa. Now, we know that the resettlement humanitarian admissions that you all are doing in Ireland is extremely important to protect the most vulnerable. And we're working with your government there to resettle about 400 people every year from different countries. But we need to move away from this mindset of traditional refugee resettlement and start to think about people as people, not just as migrants or not just as refugees. Look at the talents that they're bringing, the skills that they have, the capacity, the sense of entrepreneurship that they are bringing into your economy. Now, the EU is funding a, a project called the Displaced Talent for Europe Partnership, and that is connecting displaced skilled professionals from places like Jordan and Lebanon with employers in Ireland and the UK and Portugal and Belgium. And we're working with a fantastic organization called Talent Beyond Boundaries, uh, which is really focused on how we can connect talented displaced people or skilled displaced people with job opportunities. But it's not yet at scale. The idea has not caught on at the level it's needed to. There's some exciting initiatives underway. There is a fantastic company or a, a partnership called Tent founded by um, the CEO of a yogurt company in the United States called Chobani. And they bring together businesses who are committing to, to hire migrants and refugees and then work with those companies to integrate them into their workforce. It is a great way to combine both a humanitarian uh, purpose with a workforce need. And another avenue, and this is something that Ireland has really been on the forefront of, is engaging with diaspora groups. You all have the most effective diaspora of, of almost any country in the world. And we see that there's just tremendous power by leveraging the global diaspora, whether you're Irish or Sudanese or um, Haitian. And our goal is to work with communities, building on the outcomes of the 2022 Global Diaspora Summit that culminated in the Dublin Declaration, to really move forward to engage diaspora organizations around the world, including young people, including women, to emphasize the role they can play in humanitarian response and in sustainable development. So, so that's a lot that I've put out there. 
ultimately, bottom line is that we want to promote humane and orderly migration. We know that it benefits all people. We know that it has this tremendous power of change in very positive ways. But to do this well, we need the countries of origin. We need countries of transit. We need the countries of destination to work together. We know that nobody can do this on its own. We believe that Ireland in particular, given its rich and extensive history of migration, frankly, its high profile on the UN Security Council and its consistent support of migrant and refugee issues globally through Irish aid makes it a key actor in these efforts. And perhaps, frankly, no one is better placed than the Irish to understand both the challenges, but also the enormous potential of migration and the importance of providing people with safe pathways and opportunities to flee poverty, to flee hunger, to flee persecution, and to ultimately offer their talents and their skills where they can be used. Now, changing the narrative is going to start at home. And I know that that is a tough sell right now across Europe and including in Ireland and certainly in my own country. But it starts at the local level, right? It starts with your mayors, with your church groups, with your school groups. It's important that people understand why migrants are arriving, why some need protection, but also how and why they can enrich their communities economically, socially, and culturally. I mean, ultimately, we believe that no one is better placed than the Irish and the, the government of Ireland to help shift this global narrative. And no one is better placed to demonstrate how well-managed migration can work to drive greater economic prosperity and more sustainable development all around the world. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and I can't wait to answer your questions. Thank you very much um, for that really um, exceptional presentation. And if you don't mind my saying, what a brilliant use of slides. I don't know if you had somebody there doing that with you or whether you were doing it yourself. I suspect you were doing it yourself. But no, brilliant. no, I have a fabulous, fabulous person who is working with me to get that. Really, like, I mean, we, you know, since since the lockdown, you know, we've had some everybody all across the world using webinars all the time. And people don't always get it right with the slide, but just fantastic illustration of the points that you were making. Really exceptional presentation. And, and, and thank you for it. And like the main thing that comes across to me is so often the issue of migration is framed as a problem. So it's it's framed the problem or even the, the C word challenge, you know, so these words that are used Whereas like your presentation is just completely different framing. Yeah. So so it's yes, there are problems, yes, there are difficulties, but can you know, can we see the opportunity as well? Can we see the really because this is this is something that's that's with us, part of the modern world and will be into the future for all kinds of reasons. So it's not it's not something that um, you know, and also the thing about the narrative, like we said changing the narrative, but you're pointing the way not just to the change in the narrative, but actually to concrete change in policy as well and ways of actually addressing this. So thank you so much. It's such a comprehensive uh, presentation. And I'm sure there'll be very many questions and there already are quite a few questions in. Can I just say to people that by all means, put in a question, but give us your name. If you don't mind, give us your full name, not, not, not just one part of your name. And if you've got a designation, you know, if you're working for an organization or representing an organization and you, you feel comfortable telling us um, who that is, well, it's it's always helpful to know, uh, you know, for the Institute and for others as well, just to know uh, where you're coming from, as it were. There's a great question in from Harry Williamson. Um, who's the uh, who's an economist with the Department of Finance here in in Dublin, and he thanks you for your presentation. And says that the latest UN population projections 2024 published last night. So who's up to date here? Um, project that net migration to Ireland will fall to negligible levels in the next 15 to 20 years. S surprising. This is in stark contrast to recent trends that we've seen with net migration reaching record levels last year. He's wondering, Harry, is what evidence is there to suggest that migration to high-income countries will fall in the coming decades, or, or do you see the opposite occurring? So, what's your instinct? Your, you know, what's your reaction to those 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 numbers that are published, and what, what do you think the real story is? So, so interestingly, in the population uh, projection report that came out, what you'll see very clearly is that economies especially across the global north, are all going to face these demographic challenges because they simply are not having 
the number of children that they used to have. And that is going to create more and more economic concerns for, for countries. The countries like Japan and the Republic of Korea, Italy, Greece, Portugal are on the sharp end of the stick right now. They're all feeling it right now. Um, but across the world, not and not just in the North, obviously, we're seeing it in the North, but also in countries like Uruguay or Barbados, they just don't have the population they need, right? So that's why this, this rhetoric around migration is so dangerous, because for a country like Ireland, you need to attract migrants, you need to bring in the skills to continue the fantastic development you've had over the last several decades. But the anti-migration rhetoric could actually depress migration at a time when you need it most. Now, the demographics on the flip side suggest that there's going to be movement of people no matter what, because the number of young people in across Africa, for example, is going to account for 40% of the total number of young people in the world. And quite frankly, many of the economies now in Africa do not have sufficient numbers of job opportunities. So this is where we need to, need to move away from this conversation about migration is terrible and move toward how do we make sure people have the skills they need, have access to the job opportunities, um, and can we can have more efficient distribution of people around the world so that more countries can continue to move forward, can continue to innovate and develop. So I don't think it's that migration will stop. But what I do think, they certainly won't stop because the demand is going to be high, including in countries like Ireland. But the idea is, can we make it work in a way that is not, not harmful to the migrants themselves and doesn't fuel this very negative migration rhetoric that we're seeing around the world? Sure. Sulagna Maitra is um, um, in the UCD Center for Humanitarian Action as the University College Dublin Center for Humanitarian Action. And he's actually put in um, two questions, um, which is a bit naughty, but I'm going to um, try and get them both in. Um, he thanks you, thanks you as well for your energy, energizing presentation, fan of your humanitarian work. He's wondering if you were aware of Frontex's recent policies on handling illegal migration and how would you engage with them to lobby for greater protection for the forcibly displaced? And then the second question is, um, I have one more question. He said, on behalf of a student of mine who's writing her master's thesis, increasingly the forcibly displaced due to environmental reasons using social media uh, to draw attention to their plight and to advocate for themselves. To what extent does the does the organization and other humanitarian agencies mine this data to inform a needs analysis? Quite an interesting question. So using so the social media, can you mine that? Does, might that help? And also then the question about Frontex. So two questions. So um, interestingly, Frontex over the the last couple of years has really gone through some significant changes um, wow. including having a new having new leadership and having greater scrutiny of their own practices. So we see with even within um, the European Union and in Frontex itself, a recalibration of its ways of doing business. Now our job is is different, right? We we are working with some communities who have been returned, people who've been returned to help them reintegrate once they come home. And that's where, we think it's critically important if people are going to be returned home, you can't just drop them off at home and walk away and say, I've done my job. In fact, when people are coming home, they often face discrimination. Entire communities have fundraised crowdfunding to send you know, their young person um, on this irregular journey, expecting that they will go and make money and send it back home. And so when somebody comes home, they often face pretty significant barriers to reintegrating, to finding a job, to be so being socially accepted. Um, and that's actually the place where we're really encouraging Frontex to, to work with us and other partners. How do we enable people to even leverage the tremendous opportunities that they had. Maybe they've learned a new language. Maybe they've learned new skills. Maybe they've seen new ways of doing business. Those are all, all things that should be 
celebrated and leveraged to drive development in their home countries. So thinking about it, instead of just a return, which is often sort of where Frontex comes in, to, uh, well, how do we actually make this work? How do we turn this into a development opportunity? Now, on the data side, I don't know specifically how much social media is playing into our analysis. I want to say two things um, on the point, though. One is the importance of data, and second is the importance of um, what's happening in terms of environment and climate change. Now, we are increasingly using data. We have something called the um, displacement tracking matrix, where we have people who are engaging with migrants one-to-one -one all over the world. It is one of the richest sources of information. It helps to feed the entire humanitarian community so that we can very quickly provide uh, tailor-made responses to people who are on the move and to understand why they're moving and what's driving them. So we use that. Um, some of that will include social media, um, but it also includes other forms of information gathering, direct surveys, sometimes mapping, um, engagement with community leaders, um, a whole range of tools. And, and our goal is to shift away from a anecdote-based response to one that is very data-driven. And so we're looking at all the different data points that, that exist. Frankly, there's some interesting opportunities, even using artificial intelligence, to start to anticipate and forecast trends here. Now, the second piece is around climate is where I think there's the greatest opportunity because much of climate displacement will be predictable. We know which communities are sitting in low-level floodplains and are likely to be flooded. We know which communities are wholly reliant on rainfall agriculture, and so a series of droughts will totally wipe out their livelihoods. Um, so, But someone who is displaced because of a climate impact has no international protection right now. So that means if you lose your home and you move across the border, you don't have any right to seek refuge there. You don't have any right to seek asylum there. And as we see so many people, hundreds of millions of people living in these climate vulnerable areas, it is absolutely critical that we start to come up with solutions. Now, I don't think it means that we reopen the refugee convention, that, that is politically a very big lift at this moment in time, but that's no excuse for doing nothing. We gotta do something to help build resilience to enable communities to find safety, to enable people to adapt to what's coming. And I think that is another place where data can really inform our work moving forward. Sure, I'm gonna take a couple of questions together. They're kind of all on similar um, aspects. Sarah Leonard asks a really kind of nice sort of tight question, but it sort of incorporates a lot of what you've, you've been saying and I, I want to achieve. How do you explain um, that migration is, um, how do you explain that migration is such a sensitive issue in many Western countries if it has so many benefits for everyone? So it's kind of a little bit of a twist in the question. Yeah. Um, if it's such yeah. a good thing, why why is there such negativity? Um, and then Caleb, Kyle, there's no doubt that inward migration can be beneficial to economies. As stated, the challenge is that the system is overwhelmed which is driving anti-immigration and right-wing rhetoric and protest. How do we build in some slack in the system to allow recipient countries to prepare appropriately and manage immigration sustainably? One idea may be interim safe zones, for example. Well, that's interesting. So um, there, I have, I have a couple of uh, theories, some which are well supported by evidence on um, the, the fact that migration is just a sensitive issue. I would point out, I mean, part of even the framing of this conversation around Irish migration is that Irish migration was very poorly received in the United States at the time that Irish migrants were coming in. And Irish migrants were not only facing discrimination once they arrived, they were often living in overcrowded situations um, with access, poor access to services and complaints from the host communities about that wave of migrants. So this is not new. This has been happening for centuries all over the world. You know, right now in Pakistan, we're seeing an anti-Afghan migration wave play out where Afghan migrants are being pushed out of 
of homes they've lived in for, in some cases, 40 years. Um, and, and it is the same kind of dynamic. The Afghans are different and they're not part of us and we want them to be, to leave, right? It's this, this othering to use a, you know, uh, maybe overused word, but, but that is playing out and that is just very human, um, unfortunately. But the other thing, frankly, is that migrants don't vote. And that's particularly critical. This year, half the world is voting. If you're a politician and you want to make your case that you're the person, either that the other guy has done the wrong thing or you're the person who's going to fix things, it's very, very easy to demonize migrants because they can't push back. They're not going to go to the polls and vote you out or vote for you, right? So we are seeing it as a very politically expedient political strategy to blame all of society's ills on migrants because what are they gonna do about it, right? So that that is quite acute and we're seeing that in polling um, around the world. But also, I mean, it, it is, it doesn't mean that there are no challenges, right? There are impacts when large numbers of people move into a community that is not anticipated them. That is that is true. And I think we just need to recognize that as being true. But that's why I, I am framing the solutions around migration is not just about your border control services. It's not just about your, your home affairs or your interior minister or your foreign minister. Migration has to be a whole of society approach. If you know you have labor shortages and you are reliant on migration um, to meet them, so take Canada, for example, a country of, of migrants for many, many years, they rely on migration to fuel their industry. You can't just let expect that the market is going to take care of it all on its own. The planning, the engagement on urban planning with education ministers, finance ministers, access health health access to health care and and health ministers sort of bringing in all the parts of the government bureaucracy and then civil society mayors teachers etc that's where we see better outcomes because mm. we're talking about people people who have needs people who bring great advantages to communities but there's still people who are going to access those services and so we're really advocating to bring the rest of the community to the table and not leave the decision-making just in the hands um, of one particular cone mm. within a government. Yeah, so many of the questions that are coming in just reflect, your, your, I think, your own thinking. So people are asking a question, but they're giving their own view as well, which is which is fine. Although, mind you, just for... Um, just to note, uh, as regulars, I was going to say regulars, regular listeners will understand, but um, members and uh, people who attend our events, the tighter and the shorter your question, the more likely it is to be taken because it, it pops up on a um, little box for me here and I have to read it and then put it to our guests. So it's always the the, 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 the shorter ones and the pithier ones to get through. But um uh, I am going to take a slightly longer one because I think it's good, but it's as much commentary as anything else. It's from Aideen Elliott, who's a senior policy and research coordinator with Oxfam Ireland, thanking you again um, for your presentation um, and, and for outlining very well the juxtaposition between the reality of the benefits of migration and the misperceptions that fuel hostility. Um, and Aideen says, however, it seems that politicians and policymakers uh, play into the misperceptions by repeatedly pledging to reduce the numbers of people arriving in their countries. So how can we convince policymakers and politicians to embrace the benefits of migration, which is what you've been talking about, reduce the number of deaths, not by, quote, cracking down on smugglers, unquote, because that ignores the push factors, but by increasing the number of safe and regular routes to seeking protection, for example, by humanitarian visas, she says, and to take account of the reality that 76% of Irish people support all asylum seekers, according to the Irish, according to the Economic Social and Social Research Institute. So there's quite a, some commentary there, which is not a million miles from what you've been saying yourself. So by all means, add to that if you like. Um, and I was going to ask you um, as well, uh, just 
uh, our, our researcher uh, Tara Kukic, who did a great job here, by the way, and uh, in, in putting together this this webinar. And one a question that that she has suggested is, you, you know, we've come well. There's been a British general election, a change of government, and um, Rwanda was so big as an as a an issue there, and the previous Conservative um, government's uh, plan was described by um, Keir Starmer the day after he became prime minister as as really something of a gimmick is is what he he how he described it so they're going to be looking at their approach uh, into the future but you've seen similar proposals in Denmark and in Italy this uh, this notion of outsourcing asylum to other countries um i'm wondering if if you've in the organization if you've looked at that trend and whether you have any comments to make on that yeah so um uh in terms of persuading people about um, the benefits of migration. Honestly, I don't think it's it's just me saying so and um, Aideen, uh, who sounds very, very well educated about it, saying so, right? Frankly, we need to look for other partners, maybe even non-traditional partners. And I see two um, key partners, maybe three key partners that are relevant here. In some cases, um, it's it's mayors of small towns that have emptied out because of um, young people going out and, and getting jobs, leaving behind an aging community, right? We hear from mayors all over the world that they need migration and they can be very effective voices as representatives of their communities about why migration is needed, whether it's to revitalize the high street or to help bring in um, care for, for aging citizens. The second is um, leveraging the private sector because everywhere I go in the world, I was just in Canada um, and, and in Mexico, two countries that have had pretty significant labor shortages. You have one conversation, you sit down with the Chamber of Commerce and you hear right away they need migration and they do not have the workforce they need. And it is not just the doctors and engineers and software technicians they need. They need migrants from all over the range of skill sectors. They need people who will work in farming and people who will work in manufacturing. We actually need people to meet the Paris Green Climate Goals. And without migration, we won't meet them. But the best person to say that is not necessarily the climate activist. It's the solar panel man manufacturing company that can say, look, like this is good for you as a country in terms of the economic benefits to make an investment and in better migration policies. So uh, again, a non-traditional partner. And then the third, which I think is such an effective way to build support for migration is around private sponsorship. So where we've seen a community group, a family, a church group sponsor uh, especially refugees or persons who are fleeing humanitarian disaster, make a commitment as a, as a community or family to support someone who is in need, to invest in their coming into the country, to invest in their integration, to helping them find a job, we see better outcomes. So those are three ways that I think we can actually um, help to bring other stakeholders to demonstrate why better migration is is a much better strategy than than just enforcement, um, and then frankly, it actually works. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of outsourcing asylum, I mean, I think there were. Um, this is a conversation that is happening in a number of capitals right now, and again, it goes to this misperception that if you make migration difficult, people won't come. And it ignores the fact that there are these tremendous pressures on people to leave. And frankly, so many stories of people who've succeeded, even if they've taken an irregular migration journey, that it totally outweighs any evidence mm -hmm. that outsourcing migration is going to be a sufficient deterrent. It's also, quite frankly, we're not, we're not seeing good evidence that these systems will work well. So we never really tested it with the um, Rwanda system because it didn't really ever take off, but there are always concerns about how are you gonna make sure that rights are respected? How are we gonna make sure that um, people can seek asylum? Like there are a whole bunch of operational logistical things that were just not really clear. Instead, mm -hmm. what, what I do think is a promising practice is something we're seeing in the Americas 
where they're setting up something called safe mobility offices along the migratory route where people who are on the move can be assessed about their protection needs, be assessed in terms of their skills, um, be assessed in terms of their intent around leaving, and often find a regular pathway, either a humanitarian visa or family reunification or uh, refugee resettlement before they go all the way up the route. So that is the kind of innovative thinking that I, I think that the European Union is looking to and should be looking to in terms of addressing the needs of people on the move. Sure, and we're coming. We're up on the hour, so if you don't mind, we might just take another three, three or four minutes. If that's is, is that okay with you? Are you under pressure? Or just we, we we will wrap yeah. up in about five minutes. Five minutes. Va Valerie Hughes has been uh, through in relation to um, a concern in relation to Syrian uh, refugees, in particular in the Lebanon at the moment, um, and a, a sort of a generalised uh, question, if, if I can, um, but drawing on what Valerie says in respect of particularly Syrian refugees in, in the Lebanon, uh, um, with a concern, a very real concern that they're being, you know, uh, sent back to Syria and some have, and she's given examples of it. And she has, a, you know, a um, question about um, refugees fleeing conflict or persecution and the what, uh, what Valerie is describing as the abandonment of the whole refoulement um, principle uh, in, in this regard, and this obviously in in, center, in 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 areas of conflict is a is a massive issue for so many people. Uh, and uh, kind of, and I don't want to say the two things are the same because no two conflicts are the same. But I've, we have a question from Anurada Sen, um, who's joining us from Italy this afternoon, thanking you again as a human rights research student. I'm grateful for the note about the Afghan refugee pushbacks in Pakistan. And, he's, and he says that the Indian legal system doesn't even recognize refugees and has been deporting Rohingya refugees for the past year, not to mention the Citizenship Amendment Act or whatever. So with even, he says, without, with even South Asia having adverse reactions to migration and Europe leaning towards more pro-right wing and the undertones of dissatisfaction in Irish communities, again, the question is, what are the steps that can be taken? And of course, that's exactly what you've been dealing with for the last hour. But it's really just that point about particular conflict um, situations around the world and the, the really concerning one that Valerie Hughes, who's one of our regular attenders here in the Institute and uh, has raised it and fair play to her, has raised it again, again and again. And I was wondering if you would comment on that. Yeah, so I, I think this goes to the point of when people are fleeing, when they're displaced, they're most likely to go to a neighboring country or to a country in the region. The, the Syrians did not all come to Europe, even though at moments people thought, oh my gosh, there's so many Syrians. Really, mm -hmm. the countries that were hosting millions of Syrians were the neighboring countries. And we're seeing this unfortunate trend, and it, it's a reaction to the fact that there are so many crises and so many people living in, in protracted displacement situations that the traditional donor community that would support those displaced persons who are, whether they're in places like Chad or in Jordan or in Lebanon, are now saying, well, we've done that enough. Our populations don't care about the issue of Syria anymore. So we're going to withdraw our funding to help support those communities who are displaced. And that me leaves the burden of supporting those communities on the country who is hosting them alone, which then in turn fuels increasing pressure on the systems of that country, many of them who do not have high capacity. As you know, Lebanon is facing pretty significant issues at the moment in time in terms of inflation, for example. And there are two things that are happening. One is it's very convenient and easy to scapegoat migrants. And second, the countries have legitimate concerns about providing support to millions of people. And so what you then see is a tension within that country, that hosting country that becomes very anti-migrant, very anti-refugee. We saw that in Tunisia there. And we, by the way, we saw it also across Latin America. 
where Venezuelans and Haitians who had been living in the in countries across Latin America for years started to feel the pressure to leave as xenophobia started to grow. And as the, the atmosphere, the environment became less welcoming and it became more and more difficult for them to find a job or make a living. And so then you saw them leave the country where they first settled. So the same thing is now happening in Lebanon. And so our what we urge governments to do is to recognize that often the pressure to support communities who are displaced is coming onto countries that already have difficulties, that have lower capacity. And you can't just walk away from that kind of support and expect that everything's going to be fine. It's not a surprise that people will start to leave if they become the, the target of xenophobic attacks, wherever sure. they are. So sure. it's connecting these dots. I'm very conscious of time. Thank you so much for 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 being with us. Um, and I, I think it's an early it's early in the morning there. I'm sure you've got a busy day ahead. There's loads more questions. Um, I hope we get an opportunity in the future maybe to address some of those with you. Um, I know here in the institute we we you know we would. Um, very much want to work closely with you and obviously with Irish Aid and others and all the many organisations represented on this webinar this afternoon on this issue of migration. It's such a critical one. Thank you for a superb presentation and Thank for you. indulging us for an extra few minutes after the hour and for dealing with the questions. It's just been a, a, a great event and thanks also to Irish Aid once again. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here with you today and I appreciate the, the engagement and interest. 